Hello and a very warm welcome to the second episode of the Feeling Good mini series. My name is Serena, I use the pronouns she, her, and I work for the charity The Foundation for Positive Mental Health, alongside Becky, who I'll be interviewing today. Becky is an experienced English teacher with a professional and personal interest in mental health. And in this podcast, Becky shares her lived experience of burnout. I really admire Becky's ability to be vulnerable in sharing her experience. It's these honest conversations that can really help normalise our experiences of mental adversity. I also think burnout is a particularly relevant topic in the current climate, with the reported rise of pandemic burnout, which individuals are still dealing with today. Because Becky and I had so much to say on this topic, I've had to split our conversation into two episodes. In the following podcast, we'll be discussing ways to prevent burnout. But without further ado, here is this week's episode, Lived Experience of Teacher Burnout. We hope you enjoy. First, Becky, I wonder if you could please introduce yourself and um, tell us a bit about your background. Yes, hello. I'm very excited to be in the second uh, episode of this. Um, so I'm Becky and I've been I've been teaching for over 10 years um, and working for the charity part time as well. Uh, not for quite 10 years, but for a few years. Um, I'm an English teacher, um, but I've got uh, an interest in well-being and mental health through the work at the charity and also through uh, my, my job as a teacher and the pastoral side of that. Um, I use she, her pronouns, um, and I'm excited to talk about my experience of burnout and what I think it means for teachers at the moment. Nice. Amazing. Yeah, lots of lots of teacher experience. So yeah, it'll be valuable in our conversation. Um, so, yeah, I mentioned in the intro um, the impact of like pandemic on people's well-being. Um, and actually, um, YouGov did a, a survey of a thousand teaching staff and one in two reported having suffered at least one characteristic associated with work-related burnout all the time since the beginning of the 2021 school year, which is, yeah, quite um, a significant statistic. That's like 50%. Um, I guess first it would make sense um, to maybe talk about what burnout is. So for you, Becky, you know, what is what is burnout? What does that mean to you? Uh, so I think it's about existing rather than living. It's a constant state of exhaustion when you have no energy to do anything besides work. Um, and it's happening over a pro- prolonged period of time rather than just a brief period. Mm. Yeah. So kind of an extended um, feeling of drain. Yeah, we all have those sort of short bursts of time where we need a bit of a pick me up we need maybe a, to go to bed a bit earlier or we need to yeah change our routines a bit to look after ourselves but when it's been going on for a really long time and you're in this kind of place that you can't see a way out of I think that's um that's more what it means to be burnt out than just having a brief period of stress yeah yeah um I wonder what you what you um think of that statistic I mentioned um that one in, one and two um, reported having a characteristic of burnout all the time. Yeah, it doesn't surprise me, and it especially doesn't surprise me in recent times with the pandemic um, as the backdrop to that. Um, I think juggling working as a teacher, I mean, that's my, the experience I can speak from, um, but juggling that alongside having children at home, for example, again, that's my experience, and adapting to a new way of teaching. So teaching online, teaching live, sending work packs, finding ways to get feedback to pupils uh, in a different way than we'd ever done before, and all of it without any training. And again, yeah. I know a lot of other industries face these sorts of pressures, by, so I can only speak from my experience in teaching. But I think it's the fact that it's it's working with young people who are live people, who are not grown into adults yet, who don't have 
that kind of understanding that other adults might have about the way that the circumstances have changed and we have to adapt to them. So it's a lot to sort of be the support person for and then still try to get the actual teaching of the subject done in a in an efficient way. And, and like I say, balancing that alongside your own pressures at, at ho- of being at home and ha- perhaps having children of your own to look after during the lockdowns. So I'm really not surprised, but I don't think that burnout is a new thing that's been caused by the pandemic. Right. There was, uh, there's a lot of research around, a lot of surveys around before the, pand- the pandemic that suggested as a result of pressures in terms of accountability, mm-hmm. first and foremost, I'd say, um, teachers were a lot of teachers were talking about burnout, moving careers, that kind of thing. Yeah, can you talk more about um, what you mean by yeah, the accountability issues? So. Yeah, so I think a lot of people have talked about Ofsted and the pressures of Ofsted and the, this sort of constant um, devil on your shoulder, if you will, when you're thinking about Ofsted coming in and schools uh, worrying about league tables. So rather than just being freed up to kind of teach your lessons and what most of us went into it for was that sort of, being at the front of the classroom and, and and building those relationships with young people. That's I was a youth worker before I was a teacher. So it was always about the young people. And I think that the um the the pressure in terms of accountability, the the, the amount of data that's um expected, um the kind of the way that planning has been uh put in a put it's put teachers in a position where they're not sort of freed up to teach what they think people's need without going through a checklist of what's expected from the top um right. is that head teachers feel to meet the criteria of Ofsted which feels a lot to me like preparing pupils for exams and preparing pupils academically but then there is less time spent on the well-being of both pupils and staff um and the result of that is that you just sort of feel like you're constantly working yeah. um, I mean I've talked to you before about um what life as a full-time teacher was like for me and the reason why I'm not working as a full-time teacher now um it would be kind of do your work at school um do finish your teaching day stay behind for maybe a meeting or a training session or to do some data entry or to do some um you know one-to-ones with anyone you were line managing or checking books um I generally leave school around 5 five fifteen, go and pick my kids up from nursery uh, get home sort them out bedtime for them have my tea and then get the laptop out and kind of carry on um often till quite late at night during the week and then at the weekends too and that's quite typical of a lot of teachers that I speak to um particularly when you're you're new to the career and you're not really sure how to cut corners or what to sort of say no to yeah and like you said there's not necessarily that training also um surrounding like handling all the responsibilities and like how to like look after your well-being yeah, yeah and I I and I think, and I know, and again, I know this is um, this is true of other industries as well. I, I guess it's the perception as well sometimes from people outside of schools who think that you start teaching uh, the beginning of the school day when the pupils arrive, and you finish your your day, your your work that day when the pupils leave. Yeah. Uh, plus, obviously, you get the holidays, so the perception of teaching is that it's quite a luxury job. You you know, you get paid for having many fewer hours than other jobs. So, what what, what have you got to complain about? Um, and I guess my response to that from my experience would be that during term time, you're working kind of 12 hour days um, and then working the weekends as well. Um, so by the time it comes to, to the school holidays, you're so exhausted that you just need time as recovery time. Yeah. And for me as a parent now, that's not really that doesn't work for my lifestyle because I, I need to have more energy than that when it comes to the downtime. I need to have downtime. Um, so you know it's I think particularly when you're you're new to the profession and you're enthusiastic and you want to prove yourself and you've perhaps got ambitions career-wise you really put that time in because you don't want to be seen to not be when all around you it seems that everybody else is putting that time in so then there's almost this kind of competition you know who's the most tired yeah who, who stayed up the latest last night like who who what time did you close your laptop and it's like a badge of honor to be the most tired, to be the most, you know, the the one that's done the most work. Yeah. But that becomes a bit of an unhealthy environment then because you kind of feel like you can't speak up and say that you're struggling because everyone's in the same situation as you. So why are you the one to complain? Yeah. Why should you be the one that 
yeah I think that's so interesting and I think it's expansive also of kind of like wider culture and that just this attitude of like having to be really really productive all the time or like pushing yourself even when maybe you might be overwhelmed um but actually you know the reality is that if you are really overwhelmed the you know most important thing you do probably is to kind of maybe take a bit of a step back so that you can keep sustaining the productivity yeah and I, and I, t- I completely agree with that and I talk about this idea of um you can't pour from an empty cup and I think a lot yeah, of I love that question too it's you have to look after yourself and be well yourself in order to get the best outcomes so even though I was working really really hard and working really long hours and putting loads of time into my planning and my data and everything else um, I was exhausted and I wasn't giving any of my good side to my family because they were just getting this yeah. sort of short tempered, tired, snappy person. I was using up all my patience at school yeah. and it just felt like I was completely working to live. Um, but I think that put me in in um, in a place I'd, I wasn't loving the job anymore. And, I, and that must have that must have shown amongst the pupils, uh, you know, and, and with my colleagues. Um, and I think that it being a bit more aware of of how you're feeling and, and actually realizing like you say taking that step back and thinking it's okay to actually think you're not enjoying things anymore so that you, you yeah. might need to you might need to have a little think about what's going on yeah 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 you you mentioned um a bit about your kind of experience um I was wondering if you could like expand on um yeah your experience with burnout like what happened and yeah, so I um I had my second child and my my older two are two years apart. So um I went back to to, to teaching full time um when he was about about eight or nine months old. Um, and obviously I had my daughter and she was two. Um and I also had um additional responsibilities at school. I was a lead practitioner and whole school literacy coordinator. So as well as the the teaching timetable, I had these other responsibilities. Um And I was, I had all these plans. I thought I'd been quite good at putting things in place to make sure that I could achieve a work-life balance. So I was in, I wanted to make sure I kept fit. So I was sort of doing my exercise before school so that it wasn't impacting on my time after school. So I was getting up early to do that. Um, And my my children were in nursery. um, So I would do the day that I described earlier, kind of finish about quarter past five go and pick them up from nursery, try and spend a bit of time with them before bed, get them ready for bed, et cetera, et cetera. But I was still doing the whole laptop out, working till late, working some of the time on the weekends. So my partner would take take them out maybe to give me a bit of time to work on the weekends. Um, and it just got, it just reached a point where um, I was, my, in fact, my head teacher just mentioned to me in conversation that a, a role for an assistant head teacher position was coming up soon and would I be applying for it? And I said to him, actually, I, I'm thinking of asking you if I can reduce my hours, um, go down to part-time because I'm I'm actually finding it quite difficult to manage these full-time hours. So we'd kind of talked about it and, you know, and then it, it, it was, I was lucky enough for it to materialize and I went down to three days a week. And at first that seemed to work okay. Um, I had my other two, my two children on my two days sort of off from school. Um, but because of the nature of the role as well with the additional responsibilities, I started to find that um, the, additional responsibility side of thing was kind of still full time. So I was still having to do all mm-hmm. things that, yeah. that role expected. And even though my teaching time table was reduced to three days, um, some of the other responsibilities still felt like a full time job. So I was squeezing more time into, into those three days. So I started to think, actually, it's still not working. Even though I've gone down to three days, it's still not feeling like I'm managing this and I'm, I'm not feeling much happier. Um, I started to not not sleep very well I was thinking constantly and I had was only sleeping sort of a few hours a night and I mentioned it to my line manager um but I mentioned earlier that the difficulty is everybody feels like they're going through this too so when you talk about finding something hard and finding that you're not managing and you're feeling a little bit sort of stressed about it they feel that too so they're sympathetic but they haven't necessarily got any practical solutions because they're not finding practical solutions for themselves either so I talked to her about it a few times and it was just sort of, OK, well, you know, talk to me if you're feeling like this. And it wasn't much of an end in sight with it. Um, and I was just getting to the point where I was starting to feel quite emotional about the fact that I wasn't sleeping well. 
So I woke up one day and I was really emotional. I was really tired and I barely slept the night before. And I just rang her and I said, I'm, just, I'm not going to be able to come in today. I just feel really out of it. Um, I'm going to ring the GP and see, you know, if they can help. Um, and she kind of realized then that it was a bit more serious than than me just saying I was feeling a bit tired. I was really, really struggling with the sleep. I was, I used to, I commuted. I was, it was a sort of a half an hour drive and um, I was a bit worried about driving on the motorway. I didn't know if I'd, if I'd, if it was safe to do so. So I rang the GP as well. I went in and as soon as I started to speak, I just burst into tears. I couldn't get the words out. And I think it was then that I realized how bad things had got without me necessarily being aware of it. Cause you just carry on, you just keep going. Cause everyone else is doing that. Um, so the, the the GP prescribed some um, some sleeping tablets, um, signed me off work for a little bit, um, and then said about talking therapy might be an option, but there was a long waiting list. So I started to do some research on the internet, um, and I was looking specifically to see if there was anything around um, sort of support for teachers uh, with regard to therapy, because a few people had mentioned that they'd had things in the past. I'd never looked into that before. And then I found a charity called Education Support where they had a helpline. So I rang them and again, just burst into tears, could barely get my words out. And they referred me for six weeks of counselling. And through that, I became much more aware of the fact that I'd just kept going past the point of um, when I should have set, stepped back and, and thought, this isn't working, this isn't right, I shouldn't be feeling like this. And I ended up having a few months off school and... Um, trying to make myself feel better I did feel a lot better I was really engaged in the in the counseling I, I really wanted to find a solution to this and as a result of it I decided that I needed to leave mainstream school I needed to leave my teaching job and I needed to have a think about what else to do um so then I ended up working at the charity um, part-time and, and and then the term after that I picked up some um some teaching in a, a school for people with social emotional mental health issues um and, and that was just two days a week so now I feel like I have a better balance yeah wow um yeah firstly thanks so much for yeah sharing your experience on it because I think um people don't really talk about it enough first of all but yet again it's not an un like you were saying it's also not an uncommon thing so you kind of like recognizing that kind of common humanity that this is like a an experience that happens to um, a lot of people so yeah um thanks for sharing your experience on that um yeah so just like unpack a little bit of like what you're saying um and maybe ask some further questions around what yeah what was what was the most helpful thing I mean you talked about um taking kind of a step back um and uh yeah going and leaving mainstream um education for example um which by the way i think takes like a lot of strength to firstly be aware and identify what it is but then to actually like take action on it is um is really um yeah is is really yeah I, w I would really agree with you there actually i think one of the things i had this big fear about about leaving what i knew mm. and potentially the financial implications initially yeah of course yeah um I had to do it with with my partner's support because it affected both of us our you know our family so um I think I think that's the other thing you can kind of feel a little bit trapped by your bills and things like that and it's it's not easy to just walk away from something that's permanent and secure yeah. um, I was literally just this weekend somebody messaged me randomly a teacher um who had seen me make a comment on a teacher group about where I was working and um she contacted me to say that she she hoped it was all right to speak to me but she was um feeling like she needed to move on from where she was because she was feeling similar sort of similar things to what I've said yeah that, that fear of of actually saying right I'm gonna go I don't know what I'm necessarily going to yet but I need to take some time to figure out what I want to do and work out what's best for me and my family and I think that that decision to do that is really hard I think yeah at making that decision now that I've done it once and also I listen to a lot of podcasts now where a lot of people yeah. are being brave and you know making decisions based on 51% gut feeling and that that's okay and yeah. I think being a bit older and wiser I think I'd feel a bit better about doing that now but I understand that earlier on and if it's the first time you've ever made a decision that's that feels so dramatic to you like that yeah, yeah. Um, it's really scary 
but then also yeah and ultimately so important to just to be able to prioritize your your well-being and your mental health and yeah yeah and 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 actually and some people say maybe it's just about moving to a different school and a different school have a different ethos so you'd find a better work-life balance even if it was a full-time role still um in a different school um and maybe that's true maybe if I had moved to a different mainstream school I would have felt that but Mm -hmm. I didn't feel unsupported in my in my school you know I had a really nice team I had a really nice line manager um I was able to approach the head teacher with things that I was concerned about and talk to him about and I don't I don't feel that it was a um a toxic environment to work in like some of the schools that are described I think sometimes it's the pressure you put on yourself yes yeah 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 yeah. it it, it, the, the school had high expectations but they definitely wouldn't have wanted me to feel like I felt and they were mortified to find out that I felt like that and that I hadn't really spoken up and I guess I felt like I'd spoken up a little bit but maybe I hadn't been as serious about it or as formal about it I'd just sort of said things in passing and I think that was again I'm talking about your feelings is difficult especially when you feel like everyone around you is just sucking it up and getting on with it yeah really hard to express and especially when you're in the midst of it as well right sometimes it's quite hard to come to terms with it even like processing like what's going on that's right and I think that's for me that's where that counseling really helped because it was just someone focusing on me and unpacking things for me and I'd never had counseling before so I didn't know what to expect but I was really committed to the process and I think that's what made a difference yeah and it was nice to just like you say try and really work out what was causing me to feel like this because it wasn't the work alone it wasn't the hours alone it was a whole host of things that had just reached a bit of a peak Mm. but one of the first things I felt like I needed to do to make that better was think about um how how much I was enjoying either a full-time or three days a week role in the current school that I was in and again it was nothing about the school itself because they definitely would not have wanted me to feel that way so I think it was about me understanding how to take that pressure off myself right right. my head teacher once said to me um in my previous school about um you working at 70 percent your standards is enough you would still be teaching really well and everything else but it's it's about you being able to let go and get to the point where you are able to just say 70% is enough. This is okay. Yeah, I can. Yeah. And I found that hard. I was ambitious and sort of committed and had a uh, sort of high work, work ethic, work rate. I, thought, I, really said, I don't know, a, a sense of like perfectionism almost as well. Yeah, it's maybe. Like, it's like. Yeah, like I've, if I just finish this this one bit here, then it'll make things easier for the rest of the week. But as a result of that, I'm spending my whole Sunday kind of prepping for the week, you know, and then what am I getting out of my Sunday? Um, and and people say, is, you know, and again, not just in teaching, but I only know it from teaching, that um, you always have a to-do list. You never finish everything on the to-do list. But, um, you need to prioritise the important things on the to-do list. And I, never, I don't think I ever did that. I just saw this list and I was like, I just have to get through this list and then everything will be fine. And you just never get through the list. So you just feel like you're constantly working. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was, so it was, was it education support that you contacted? Yeah, yeah, oh. the charity was called Education Support. Nice. Well, yeah, because they, I, I've actually got, um, they, ha- they do have like a free confidential helpline, don't they? That's like 24 hours. Yeah, that's what I rang. Oh, no way. Yeah. yeah. I do actually have the number now, <laughs> so if any of this does find it helpful, the number is 08 um, 000 56 but obviously you can look it up too. But yeah, I just thought that was um, interesting because I am, um, yeah, I was looking into like resources for teachers um, prior to this um, recording. I was actually quite surprised because there isn't, you know, I thought I kind of expected there to be more uh, resources out there. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think I think I expected that too. And I and I actually can't really remember how I stumbled across this charity. It was, and then I thought, this is amazing. Why don't more, pe- more people know about this? Because I, I guess they must triage you a bit when you first ring up that helpline to see what you need. And for me, I think just the whole bursting into tears and not being able to get my words out made it clear to them that I needed something quite substantial quite quickly. Um, so I was lucky enough to get the six weeks counselling and I think it completely, it, it sort of like saved me from myself at that time um, yeah. and and 
made things so much better um forced me to take that step back and just reflect on what was going on and and how I needed to do something about it because it wasn't working yeah I wonder if it was a sense of like just like release as well just like finally now come to like terms of oh okay this is like yeah this is and I think for someone who struggled in the past to really talk about how I felt I, I came from a family where we didn't really talk about our feelings it was sort of like just get on with things you know be be strong and be like just get on with things that was kind of the mantra just get on with it just, just get on with it pull your socks up get on with it um and I think a lot of families have those values instilled in them and it's not through lack of love or anything I've got a really loving family it's just um not that not sort of feeling sorry for yourself and and um it almost as if that's going to make it worse but it makes you not feel comfortable then reaching out for for help and that's what I needed at that time and I and that's why I think I sort of drip fed to my team and to my line manager how I was feeling instead of just coming out with it and saying that quite seriously this is I think it's reached quite a, a bad point um because I was testing myself to see if I could talk about it and and actually, we when we were discussing doing this podcast, initially I was thinking there is no way I'm going to talk about this because I'll feel really uncomfortable talking about myself in this way. But yeah, I think, here we are. Yeah, and I know it's and 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 that counselling really helped me to just come out of that. And she had to really draw it out of me from the first couple of sessions because I just did not want to talk about things, and I really struggled to talk about me. Yeah. Yeah, and like um, it's really interesting. You mentioned that again about um, I don't know the family values, um, the experience that aren't again are not uncommon. Like this kind of idea of not not normalizing the fact that it's okay to not be okay type of thing. Um, uh, and yeah, and th- yeah, I think that's really interesting. And we kind of talked about that how it's impacted you know um being able to express yourself this stigma which I guess is like both culturally um permeated but then it's actually an internal sense of shame that's like I cannot um express how I feel because you you've got this conditioning of like it's it's not okay to be it's not okay but it is okay and, I, and, I, and so I, sometimes I find it quite ironic, the kind of job I'm in. So I'm talking to That's so true yeah. all the time, trying to teach them things about how to be, you know, more successful. And I don't mean just academically successful. I mean, in, emotionally successful. I mean, in terms of happiness yeah. with young people every day to try to make them achieve those goals. Mm-hmm. And yet I couldn't do that for myself. So I think actually I'm better at that side of the job now. I, 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 I'm, I'm sure in, in the past I was very good at getting the English results out of them, my subject specialism, but, mm. and, I, and through youth work, I would have expected to be pretty good at the pastoral side of things, but I think I'm infinitely better now. Mm. Because I've got much more of an understanding of, of uh, myself and I worked on myself so that I can be better for other people. So better for the pupils. Yeah, they use that analogy. There's that analogy out there of um, putting on your life mask, your oxygen mask before you put it on for someone else type of thing. I quite like that analogy. But yeah, yeah and I think past me would have seen that as being oh, really selfish. You know, you, you're supposed to help other people. Why is it about you? But um, I feel like you can't help. I mean, you know, it's not just people. It wasn't just in my job. I said before that I was, I felt like I was really um, using up all my patience at school. And then I was home and I was being really short tempered with my partner. I didn't have time and energy for my kids like I would have wanted to have. And um, so they weren't getting the best out of me and it was unfair on them. And, and it wasn't until I took that step back and worked on myself and realized what I needed to do differently, that I could be better for them too. Yeah, I think, um, Becky's point there you know in order to effectively support others um you first have to take care of yourself it's such an important one and I struggle doing that myself to be honest um but it makes sense if you're well rested um clear-headed and perhaps feeling positive you're you're more able to offer support to others so um a very key message that it's okay to take time for yourself 
Becky mentioned earlier in the podcast Education Support, who offer a helpline to support teachers and education staff. And I thought I would also mention that if you are a teacher involved in the Feeling Good for Schools programme, um, I wanted to remind you that you get free access to the evidence-based Feeling Good app. So that's it for this podcast. Uh, thanks to everyone listening and stay tuned for the next episode on ways to prevent burnout. Bye.